Uh, when the uh, various topics, as we chatted, uh, those of us who were speakers um, before, and uh, various topics were suggested, and uh, so I, I, I chose four of them, and they all have to do with, with sanctification. Uh, you may say, well, then why are you teaching on principles of marriage? Well, Kiddushin is, is marriage. It means to be sanctified, to be set apart from all others to each other. And so uh, I don't know that there's any specific order in which I'm uh, giving these uh, uh, talks, these lessons, but they do all fall under that basic heading of how we sanctify the name, uh, how we live to be lights to the world. I love that verse, uh, that section that uh, uh, Ariel mentioned, that the, the coastlands are waiting, and it, the, the word wait is, is intensive, uh, wait expectantly for the Torah. I was teaching in Guatemala some years ago, and I was teaching on that verse, and all of a sudden the, the, the conference just got hushed, and I started to hear people weeping. And I looked at the translator and I said, what, what did I say? What's wrong? She said, she's crying. <laughs> and she can't talk to me. And I said, okay, okay. when composure was regained, uh, I said, what's this about? She said, Guatemala in our language is called the land of coastlines because we have coastlines on both sides of us. And when you said the, the isles will wait expectantly for your Torah, that's us. We've been waiting for this for years and years and years. <laughs> and, um, you know, I know John and others uh, have similar kind of experiences in Africa where, and, and other parts of the country where, where we go and we're, we're privileged to talk and people are hungry. They're, you know, it's not a reformation, it's a revolution. Uh, and uh, the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, is opening hearts and minds. I mean, people, when, i got to tell you this story because it's uh, just quickly... When I was in Guatemala last, there were three women, and they told they told, they were the ones that were that started the whole thing in Guatemala with regard to the Torah and, and messianic things, and they were just studying their Bibles together in in the house of one of the ladies, and they were reading, and suddenly they said, "Why aren't we doing this?" And they said, they got on their faces, and began to cry out to God, "Teach us." Nobody but the Spirit of God was doing that. It was nobody in the internet, nobody sending their materials. It was just God awakening the hearts of people to something that has been missing, something that's beautiful and wonderful, not a burden, not tying us down, but freeing us so that we can live as God intends. And in doing that, we are blessed besides. And we are his witnesses to take Torah to all of the nations. Isn't this the last thing that Yeshua said to his uh, Tamedim before he ascended? He says, go and evangelize all the nations, right? Wrong. It's not what he said. No, it includes evangelism. He said, go and what? Make disciples of all the nations. How do you make a disciple? Well, first, you give them the gospel. But secondly, you tell them everything that he commanded his disciples to do. Isn't that what he said? Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. You want to know what he commanded them? Go back and read Matthew 5, 17 through 20. He said, don't let anybody tell you that I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. Oh, wait a minute. Fulfill, that means I don't have to do what you did it. Huh, I'll read the next verse. And the one who does these things and teaches others to do them will be called great in the kingdom. In fact, our righteousness is to surpass that of those that were viewed in his day as being the most righteous. How could we ever... Think to exceed the Pharisees in their scrupulous uh, looking and keeping of the Torah. Well, we wash the inside of the cup by the Spirit of God, and the outside becomes clean. We can do that best in our marriages. Now, some of you are not married. Some of you may be here as single. Maybe you've been married in the past, and your marriage uh, failed for one reason or another, and you're here as singles. Other you, others of you are young and have never been married. Some of you are middle-aged and never been married. And then many of us are married. Okay. Well, these principles apply to us all. Because if you want your marriage to be what it should be, what God intends it to be, then these principles will apply. 
if you want to make a future marriage what it should be, these principles apply. And I have way too much information, so I'm probably going to be moving quickly through it. And also, I had to put together the handout for you uh, a week early, which is out of question for me. I'm always just getting it done 10 minutes before it's supposed to be used. So as a result, there are some typos in there, and I'll just thank you to be my uh, proofreaders and correct those typos. Hopefully I've, I've corrected them on the slides that you're seeing. So Torah principles for marriage and looking at foundational truths. We're going to start at the beginning. We're going to study male and female, some basics, the effects of sin. Marriage is a covenant. What does that mean? Characteristics of a godly husband and a father, characteristics of a godly wife and a mother. And we're even going to eventually get to betrothal and dating and strengthening our marriages, preparing for marriage. Am I ready? <laughs> I'm a young person. Am I, do I want to be married? Am I ready to be married? We're not going to do that all this session. That's both sessions that we have. Let's start at the beginning. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man, male and female, he created them. Notice it says, let us make man. But then it says, and let them. He says, let us create. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, but then male and female, he created them. So when it says he created him, it's talking about mankind. Let us make mankind in our image. You see, right from the very beginning, we discover that God intends mankind to be male and female in a way that will show forth his image. What is this image and likeness? Well, image, of course, is the Hebrew word zelem, which can mean a statue or a carved image. It can mean a likeness. It can mean an outline. So the word likeness or out, outline means demut. It's something that looks similar. We find these, again, in uh, Genesis 5.3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image, same words, and named him Seth. Therefore, the terms image and likeness teach us that we share some very important characteristics with our creator. You know, as a son, I grew up, and, 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 and as I got older, uh, people would say to me, you know, you look like your dad. Or they'd say, well, you kind of look a little about your, mostly like your dad, a little bit like your mom. And they would say, well, you look like your dad, but you talk like your mom. You know, really, you know, as my dad was soft-spoken, my mom was very the opposite. And, uh, uh, you know, I and my, my grandpa, my grandpa Schwartz, uh, are you kidding me? Everybody knew that, you know, you better watch out about grandpa, because if he doesn't like what you did, he's going to tell you. And he's not going to wait for anybody to leave the room. <laughs> uh, so we loved Grandpa Schwartz, and, you know. Billy and Mamie Schwartz, we, we, you know, they, were, they lived close to me. I went over to their house all the time. We'd make popcorn and play games and do all kinds of wonderful things. So he was a wonderful man, but he would tell you exactly what he was thinking. So we're, we're like our parents. We're not exactly alike. We look alike. We have the outline. We have the image. We're not exactly alike, but everybody kind of knows. I mean... I don't want to embarrass anybody, but there's a family here with their children, and I looked at them and I said, I can tell you all our family. <laughs> you all look alike. Likeness. Let's read a little further. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in the image of, uh, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and, uh, and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over it, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing. So do you see how the things that God gave mankind to do, he gave to them? 
to, to subdue it, to rule over. All of those things were given to male and female together. So we can put it this way. God created us, male and female, to be partners in serving him. He blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That's a plural imperative. Guess what, guys? We couldn't do that alone. Fill the earth. We couldn't do that alone. That's a plural imperative, a plural commandment, a commandment that's given to more than one person, so given to both. Subdue the earth is a plural commandment. Rule over them is a plural imperative. You look at the Hebrew and it's very, very clear. So what does that mean? There's mutual dependence. Each needs the other. Now, I know some of you guys are going to say, Tim, why are you beating us up? This whole thing, you're beating us up. Because I'm a guy. I know how guys think. I know more about guys than I know about gals. Okay? And when I'm, when I'm pressing you, it's because I'm pressing myself. I know my thoughts. I know how I think. We don't like to be dependent, guys. You know, I'm one of those guys that if it, if it weighs 300 pounds, I can say, no, I don't need any help. I'll carry it up the stairs myself. <laughs> you know, why do we do that? We think we can do it without anybody's help. But God made us to be equal in our partnership, equal share in God's service, equal share in God's blessing. So we're created in the image of God. What does that mean? You know, I've read whole doctoral dissertations on Imago Dei, the Latin term for image of God. People are, are still trying to decide what does that mean? Well, I'm sure that I'm not going to be able to solve that today, but... I'll give you at least one aspect that I think is quite clear. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. But then the next verse, he says, God created man in his own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Here, Elohim, at the first verse, in verse 26, takes a plural verb rather than a usual singular verb. Okay, I, I don't mean to get too technical, but most of you may know that the word Elohim is literally a plural. We call it a plural of majesty. Uh, uh, that, that is the God above all other gods, right? But it can the exact same word can be used of false gods, Elohim. However, when it's used of the one true God of Israel, it almost inevitably it uses a single verb. Now, what's the big deal? Well, in Hebrew grammar, when you have a plural verb, you must have a Plural, uh, plural subject, you must have a plural verb. It's contrary to grammar to have a plural noun, a, a plural subject, and then have a singular verb. What do we have here? Then God said, let us make man in our image. Elohim takes a plural verb rather than the usual singular verb in this case. Let us make, and the word make is plural. So who's making it? The rabbis don't know. They have all kinds of, well, he was saying to the angels, let us make man in our image. Or else, actually, he was saying this to Adam and Chava after they were created. How about you and the three of us making mankind in our image? So, fill the earth. Well, we know that's not the case. Because the next verse says, God created man in his image. It goes back to singular. God's representing the singular, his image. There's a story told in the rabbinic literature where a, a, a heretic, one of the minim, comes and asks the rabbi, how many gods do you have? He says, one. He says, then why does it say, let us make man in our image? And he says, yes, but wherever you find plural, you'll also find in the near uh, context, uh, no, he says, whenever you find plural Elohim, you'll always find the verb in singular. As it says, God created man in his own image in the very next verse. And, and the heretic says, oh, okay, good. You answered my question. He left. His student said, you answered him with a trifle. We know better. The verse before has a plural verb. What are you going to say to us? Then he comes in and says, well, he was talking to the angels. They do not want to admit that the mystery of the Godhead is revealed to us in plurality. We can't understand it when we try to take it apart and fit it together and rationalize it, we ruin it. But God reveals himself in plurality. 
yet there is only one God and an infinite unity. The one God reveals himself in plurality. We might say, Father, Messiah, Ruach, yet one. Guess what? He made mankind in plural, plurality too. And Moses breaks into the story, right? Genesis 2.24 is a theological interjection by Moses, right? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they, plural, shall be what? Echad, one flesh. How can two be one? Everybody covetous about the fact, well, you don't believe in the plurality of the Godhead, do you? Yes. Well, you can't have more. That's more than one God. And I've asked people to say, well, does it bother you that the husband, the man will leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall be one? Why don't you ever get bothered about that? The fact that God created mankind as male and female means he created humans who are clearly different. Don't we realize that? Yet God created them in their differences with the ability to be one flesh. This may be, in my opinion, the most significant aspect of God's image in mankind. The ability to be plural, yet one. We have the ability to show the world, to show each other, that God in his plurality is one, even as we in our plurality can be one. It's not surprising then that the enemy of our souls is intent upon destroying the image of God that exists in the one flesh of marriage. In our land, it's amazing. In the United States of America, I don't know what's going on in some of the other countries. But homosexuality and so-called same-sex marriage has become law in many, many states and probably will be in all the states. It's mandated. It's getting into every area of our government that you can't, if you teach against it, you, you, know, you're, you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't have that. Even schools that are seeking accreditation, like Torah Resource Institute, are coming under the question of whether or not we will teach against uh, uh, equality of, in marriage, as they say. And that will, may become a question of whether or not the government will give uh, accreditation to a school if they're not willing to conform to that. Why is the enemy so intent on that? Why when we see a society, historically or even in modern times, stooping to the lowest echelons of sexual immorality, do we see the same things happening? Sacrifice of children, the demise of the society, dropping into morose the, the way we've never seen it before. So let's summarize this part. Being created in the image of God means that we share some very important characteristics with our creator. God created mankind in his image according to his likeness, and mankind consists of male and female. This means that both men and women bear the image of God. We bear the image of God together. One fundamental characteristic that we share with our creator is the ability to be diverse, yet to be one. This is why women must be women and men must be men. There must be distinction so that the oneness can be made clear. And what we see in fashions, what we see in society in our world, is we see an all kind of a, a unisex kind of a thing going on. That's not what God wants. He wants women to be women. He wants men to be men. So that in marriage we can be one, we can be diverse yet one. This unique ability to be diverse yet one is infinitely demonstrated in the oneness of God. It's infinitely demonstrated because we can't figure it out. Okay? And you know what? There's a little bit of that that happens when you're married. You've been married for a while. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier at our uh, the gathering that happened before this as we were together with uh, Beit Brachot. Uh, my wife and I celebrated uh, a week ago tomorrow uh, our 42nd anniversary. Well, you know what? My wife knows me too well. It's extremely difficult if, to hide something in, in me from her. 
Oftentimes I come to bed late because I get to study and I forget what time it is. Does that ever happen to you, Ariel? No. You know, I look at the clock and it's 11 o'clock at night and I think, okay, I want to be in bed by 12.30, I have to get up early, so forth and so on. And I get going on some Hebrew thing, or I get going on something, and I'm just saying, wow, I didn't see this before. And I start, you know, doing the tributaries, you know, and you're going to your shelves, and you're taking books out, and, you, and then you look up at the clock, and it's 3 o'clock, and you go, hey, they. <laughs> you know? So I crawled into bed, and I didn't think I woke my wife up. And a, a minute later, she says, is everything okay? I said, yeah, I just studied late. She says, no, that's not what I mean. Is there, it, are, like, you, are you stressed out? What's going on? I said, yeah, I am. I, How did you know? I can tell by the way you breathe. <laughs> I said, what? Now if I'm going to keep something for my wife, I have to hold my breath. <laughs> there is something, and I just use that illustration simply to say this, that there is something that happens between a man and a woman when they are joined together as God intends that your lives begin to become intertwined in a beautiful way so that you know each other in ways that you never could have before. So in marriage, the unity of male and female is most obviously seen in their children. The deeper reality of oneness in marriage is seen in companionship, serving each other, and in finding meaning and satisfaction in the love relationship of husband and wife. I can tell all of you uh, younger adults, Singles who are anticipating the marriage in the future. Don't listen to our society. Marriage is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's the happiest thing you can do. As long as you do it God's way. When you don't do it God's way, it can be hell on earth. The ability to be two yet one is also seen in the larger family context of community. It's not the same, but there, there is a, this, uh, an, uh, an assemblance of it. Now the question is this, why is the creation story told twice? Those of you that have studied in the Tanakh, you know that the liberals tell us all that, that you have all these different documents that have been put together and, and you know the whole story is told in, in, in the first chapter, then it's retold again in the second chapter in a different way. You've got two different authors, two different, no, nonsense. The structure of Genesis 1 and 2 is this. Chapter 1 gives you the big picture, and chapter 2 focuses in. This is the way uh, the Tanakh does a lot of times. Paul will even start out by giving you the whole story first, and then fill it out in the rest of his, his epistle. All right? So I use this illustration that's in your, you know, here we are looking at coins of, of uh, U.S. money. And the biggest coin in the middle is, is, is of course, the, what's at the center of the picture. So that's chapter 1. Chapter 2 focuses in just on what? Mankind. Because that's the crowning uh, zenith of God's creation. And I love, to, I love to remind myself of this and remind you of it too. You know why mankind's the crowning zenith of his creation? Because he knew his son was going to be mankind. Why do you think he made our bodies so wonderful? The psalmist just says, you have made me so wonderful. I, it's beyond my understanding. Why did he make the human body so unbelievably wonderful and beautiful in the way that it works? Because he knew his son was going to have one. Right? Well, think about it. I remember one time I was talking with my roommate. I was a science major in the first two years of college, and, and, uh, and he was an art major. And we would get into these philosophical things. And I said, why do you suppose that God made the universe so that hot air rises? Because my dad used to always say, not always, but sometimes say to me, Tim, if hot air rises, what's keeping you down? <laughs> but at any rate, and my roommate, without even, without even a hint, without even a pause, said, it had to. I said, why? He said, because what we talked about the other night. The word for one of the sacrifices is, is olah, which means what? To go up, to rise up. He made, every, he made hot air to rise up so that it would be the sacrifice he wanted. In other words, he created the universe in a way that would bring about the story and the purpose that he wanted. Well, that's why we have 1 and 2 of Genesis. And then we come to this wonderful passage it's not good for man to be alone in Genesis 1 it appears that God creates male and female at the same time right it says he created them male and female 
But when we get to the more detailed account, we realize that the male, Adam, was created first, then the female, Kava. It says in verse 7 of chapter 2, Then Adonai, God, formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living uh, being. So he, he started out with dust, remember that, guys, from the ground, dirt. And then he breathed the very breath of life into him, and he became a living being. Man, as created from dust, is not self-sustaining. Right? Right? He created us and we were nothing. We were, a, we, were a bun, we were a lump of dirt. And then he breathed his life into us. Man is the only created being to receive the breath of the Almighty directly. This sets him apart from all of the animals previously created. Mankind thus shares directly in the life of the Creator. That's why man is God's servant. Then Adonai took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it uh, the first thing he did was say you need to get in touch with where you came from the dirt the first jo job evaluation again for man's work in the garden is found a few verses later and it was not thumbs up right the boss came to see how his worker was doing what did he say he said it's not good for man to be alone you're not cutting it you can't do what I told you to do. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now what does that mean? It's not good for man to be alone. And I will make a helper suitable. The male on his own could not accomplish the tasks assigned to him by God. And this is, this is an example which has wide uh, application. He takes, the, he takes the garden example, but he says, look, this is the reality of things. This is a principle. On your own, you can't do what I created you for, to be my image bearer. He would need a helper without whom he could not finish the task God had given him. But let's wait a minute. This is where a lot of things have gone south. They say, oh, I get it. She was made to be my servant. Perfect. I always needed a doormat. That's not what it says. The word helper, Ezer, is used of God as our helper. Right? God is Ezri, my helper. And speaks of one who gives help from a position of strength. It isn't that you just needed somebody to help you get your job done. It's that you didn't have the stuff to get it done. You needed something you didn't have. Look at these verses. Hear Adonai and be gracious to me, Adonai. Be my Ezer. Be my helper. Behold, God is my Ezer. That's the same word, helper. Adonai is the sustainer of my soul. But you, Adonai, be not far off. O oh, you, my help. Same word. Hasten to my assistance. So was woman created to compliment man? Then God, Adonai, God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. But it says suitable for him. What is this word suitable? Kenegdo, literally, as opposite of him, in the sense of a mirror image. I'm going to make somebody like you, but has the things that you don't have that you need. And guess what? You're going to have things that she doesn't have that she needs. It's only when you put the two together that you're able to complement and fulfill what God has created you to do. So it means corresponding to him, equal to him in essential characteristics. Are we equal? No. A lot of times women are smarter than us. They're oftentimes more intuitive about things that are happening in, in the lives of others. We happen to be physically stronger than they are on, 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 the, on the general uh, way of things. And this is what Peter means when he says, dwell with your wife as a weaker vessel. She needs help carrying stuff. She's not as strong as you are, usually. The male was in need of a companion, someone like himself, in order to complete the task given him by God. Yet he could not find such a companion among the animals. Why is the story told this way? You all know. He gave, all the, uh, he gave names to all the animals. In a Hebraic perspective, when you give a name to something, what does that do? What is that about? General characteristics, the basic characteristics. It's very interesting. In Genesis 2.23, the man said, no, you know, you know the story, so I don't have to fill it all in. God 
takes, puts Adam into a sleep, removes a bone, and fashions from that bone good DNA, okay, same kind of thing, fashions from that bone Chava. Then he brings Chava to Adam, and this is what he said. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, the word now, if you look in the Hebrew, it literally means this time. Ah, this time it's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. What was he looking for in the animals? Somebody like him couldn't find anything. What does bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh mean? It's what we call a merism. It's a Hebrew merism, a set of terms that stand for the whole, such as heaven and earth means everywhere, and day and night means always. So when it says meditate in his word day and night, what does that mean? Do it all the time. When it says he's the Lord of heaven and earth, what does that mean? It means he's the Lord of everything. So what does bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh mean? It means she is essentially like me. We have the God-given ability to be one. We're the same. I know there's a lot of jokes, guys and gals, jokes. Don't ever say we're the same, Tim. We're the most opposite you've ever seen. No, according to God, in essential characteristics, we're the same. We have the ability together to portray the image of God. See, God created woman because without her, mankind could never present the image of God as he intended so he said, they shall be one flesh, Moses says. In the creation narrative, we see that God set into place certain things that are the result of the way he created. For instance, if you were marooned on an island, okay, nobody around, you don't have your iPad, you don't have your computer, you don't even have a watch. You got there with nothing but the clothes on your back. Could you tell when, it was, when the day started and when the day ended? Sure. Sunrise, sunset. Could you tell when it was springtime and harvest? Yeah, you could. Weather would tell you that if you knew enough, you could look at the place of the sun and so forth, and it would tell you. Animals and plants producing after their kind. If you saw animals, if you saw this animal on the, uh, on the island, you would say there must be more of those. This can't be the only one. Just like this, you would know that. Could you, find, could, could you, could you even find the month yeah, you could find the month. You just look for the moon. When the moon got full, you know it's in the middle of the month. When it got uh, to a sliver, it was the end of the month or the beginning of the month and so forth and so on. You could see all that. What we don't see occurring as a natural outcome of creation is marriage. You don't have to go far to figure this out. There's places in Africa where they swap as way of a culture. You have a wife for a year or two. Then she goes to somebody else. It's very, very seldom in the animal kingdom that you find a pair remaining together for life. There are some, I know, but very few. Usually you have one male and many females. Marriage is not found. You can't look at the natural, natural creation and say, oh, this is uh, what God's plan for us. No, you can't. We see all manner of natural male-female attraction, but marriage is instituted directly by God when he formed Chava and brought her to Adam. This is the first instance of Hebrew ish, man, meaning male. Chava is called isha, of course. Why? Just as Adam was formed from Adama, that is, ground or dirt, so isha is formed from ish. So we have Adam has the same consonants as Adama. We have isha, the same consonants as ish. Let's summarize. So God's direct, direct breath of life makes man distinct from the animals because man shares the very life of God. Placing Adam in the garden indicates that mankind's role on this earth is directly related to being God's servants. God gave Adam commandments. This emphasizes the truth that man will only be able to accomplish the task for which he is created when he obeys God. Adam may by himself could not accomplish the task God had given him. Chava was created from Adam's rib. The stre this stresses man, a woman's essential unity with man in terms of personhood and worth. And of course, we know the, 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 the old Midrash that says he, he, he took the bone from the side, not from the foot, so that the, she would be under his feet, and not from the head, so that she would rule over him, but next to the side, where she could be comforted and loved. Okay.
It's not a bad midrash. The woman is called a suitable helper. This means that she alone fulfills the role of an essential partner. When Adam saw Chava, he immediately recognized that she was a person like himself with whom he could have true companionship. The ability of mankind to display an essential characteristic of the image of God in which they were created and they're becoming one in the God-given marriage of relationship. Carrying the image of God means that mankind has been created to make his greatness known. Therefore, underline this one if you haven't underlined anything, the enemy will do all in his power to disrupt the oneness which husband and wife were created to have. This is one way that we can display the greatness of God and the enemy hates that. What is his scheme? The entrance of Satan, the liar, into the creation narrative teaches us that from the beginning the enemy sought to undo God's image in mankind. His plan followed a well-crafted formula to discredit God in order to break the trust relationship that mankind had with him, which in turn would undermine the interdependence of mankind upon God through selfish motivations, being conceived, uh, convinced that they could exist without God and even more that their independence independent existence would even be better. And this is still the enemy's modus operandi. Why do you think that the, uh, he told the serpent that, that he's going to eat dust the rest of his life? Do, do snakes eat dust? They tell us no. They, they get some dust in their mouth if they're crawling in certain places, but normally they don't eat dust. What's the picture there? You're going to be on your belly, so you're going to be down on the dust. But the idea of eating dust means you don't have to depend upon God for it because whether it rains, whether it doesn't rain, whether the sun shines, doesn't shine, it's dust everywhere, you've got plenty. You, can, you, you don't ever have to trust God. Different than the farmer, right, who puts the seed in the ground and says if the rain doesn't come, we, we have famine, we may die. If the rain doesn't come, if the sun isn't out, mankind is dependent upon God for his food. What's, one of, what's the worst curse you could have? to be cursed, to be independent from God? What's the greatest blessing you can have? To be created, to be dependent upon Him. So what does the enemy want us to think? It's better to be independent. Satan's goal is to cause us to mistrust what God has said and to question His goodness. When our hearts turn from Him, we also turn away from each other. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field which Adonai God had made, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said? <laughs> that's where it all started, isn't it? And that's where it continues to be. Don't let anything replace the word of God. C.H. Spurgeon said, How do you tell a crooked stick by putting a straight one next to it? The only straight stick we have are the scriptures. But everything that you learn, everything you hear, what you see, what somebody teaches you, including myself, that nothing pleases us more as teachers than when you take our teaching and say, does this align with the word of God? If it does, accept it. If it doesn't, throw it out and come and tell us. The first attack is for the enemy to sow seeds of doubt regarding God's self-revelation. This is the fundamental question. Do we receive the word of God as true and therefore submit to it, or do we put ourselves as the judge of what is good? Is God good or evil? That's the next question. The manner of the question causes Kava to doubt, right? He says, look, he's telling you all of this. He's telling you all of this because he doesn't want you to know the truth. The truth is you could be like him. You could, you could have your own universe. You don't have to be dependent upon him. He's not as good as you think he is. Causing Chava to doubt whether God was her best, had her best interest in mind when he gave them the commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These are exactly the same two questions that confront mankind today. Is God's word to be accepted as authoritative? Is God good and can I trust him? I guarantee you, in all of our lives we've experienced this. God will bring us to a point where he leads us to do what in our minds we're questioning. Is this possible that I should go this, this route? We open up the Bible and it says, well, that's, I see others doing this, but it seems like a disaster for me. 
I might lose my job. I might, who knows what will happen. If God, God's word said it, don't be afraid to step out and do it. Because if you're following God's word, which includes wise counsel of those that are in your community or in your family or whatever, if God is leading, truly God is leading you to do something, he will give you everything necessary to complete what he has told you to do. And it will be a blessing for him and for you. So our answers to these two question, fundamental questions will determine how we live our lives and specifically how we approach our marriages. What was the result of mankind's fall into sin with regard to marriage? Well, the disobedience of Adam and Kava brought about a very drastic change in the relationship of mankind to God and to each other, right? They, they first found out they were naked. Which again, I think is telling us they became selfish. The pattern of mutuality as male and female carried the image of God would now become defaced. As a result of sin that entered the world, a new pattern of male and female relationship would emerge. What did he say? To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Boy, that's the crux right there. Okay, so what does that mean? I think the key to understanding this verse and how it applies throughout our study are the words desire and rule over. The word desire, teshukatech, or if you're from the Ashkenaz, teshukasech, it's from the verb shuk, found only three times in all of Tanakh. It's found twice in our close proximity and once in the Song of Solomon. The text in, in uh, can Canticles, or uh, Shir Hashirim, is used to describe sexual desires. But the usage in Genesis 4-7, just one chapter after where we're studying, being in such close proximity to our text, is surely informative. What is more, Genesis 4-7 has, uses both words. It has the same word as in 3.16 for rule over. Now, I know I'm going quickly, but you see there's a word that says desire, and there's a word for rule over. When we come to Genesis 4.7, we find the same two words. And this word for desire is only found three times. <laughs> Both two of them are in our text and the next chapter. So the desire and rule over is the issue. Now, what does Genesis 4.7 say? If you do well, he's talking to who? Cain. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted? In other words, won't you smile? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and it's, oh, there's a word, its desire is for you, but you must master it. You must rule over it. Same words. Desire and master over it. They're the same words as in our text in 3.16. Here, however, in 4.7, sin is desiring, that is, wanting to control Cain. The divine admonition is that Cain must rule over or master sin's desire to control him. Given the close proximity, as I said, and clear parallel of the terms, the same meaning likely obtains in 3.16. Let's go back and see how that might be. In this verse, then, we should understand the final clause to mean, at least this is my suggestion, you can tell me if you think there's better. So, you will desire to dominate your husband, but he will subdue you. Does that sound like reality? The entrance of sin has caused a reversal of the roles for which male and female were created. Instead of becoming one in order to display the image of God in which they were created, they have become self-centered, each striving for their own good at the expense of the other. Now, I know. I'm being very general here. Okay, so please, sometimes generalities can take us uh, in, in a slightly wrong direction. But my own experience and my own reading and talking to people, generally speaking, don't get mad at me, ladies, but generally speaking, women desire security. You know, when the bank account gets low, the wife wants to know where the money's gone. Not because she did, wanted to buy some more things. She wants to make sure there's food for their uh, kids. She wants to make the, sure that the rent's going to be paid. She wants to make there's going to be clothes. She's going to have a place to live. She wants the security. Okay? And what does the guy want? 
He wants to fulfill his desires. He wants to be the guy in charge. He wants to be viewed by everybody as a success. So what does the woman do to gain her security? Rein him in. Right? Why don't you let me keep the checkbook? Why don't you let me be in charge of the finances? That way we won't be spent in the wrong way. That way I'll be in control. And I'll have security. And what does he say? What? You don't trust me? You don't think I'm good enough? I mean, what am I? Chopped liver? <laughs> I'll say this now. I'll probably say it again later. Women, there's nothing that a man desires more, although he may never tell you, is your open respect and appreciation of him. You know what? Let's be, okay, let's let it out of the bag, guys. We have fears. We hide our fears. We don't want anybody to know that we are, you know why guys have a hard time going to a job interview? Because they think they're going to fail. Interviews, for a lot of guys, interviews are like, never, I don't want to go. It's the same way with the dentist or the doctor. It's like the judgment day. When's the last time you flossed? <laughs> you know, we don't want people to know that. We hide all that. You know, your CPA says, give me all your, give me all your receipts, give me all your accounts. And you're saying, wait a minute, you have to know every penny. Yeah, I need to know everything that, where, where it went. It's like, is this a judgment day? Tim, you didn't really spend that much on books, did you? I said, yeah, can we write it all off? Said, well, I'm not sure. I mean, right, am I right, guys? Yes. We don't want to admit to our wives and to others that we come, we come to a job and we wonder if we're going to cut it or not. Can I do this? We get into a new job and we're, we're nervous. When my first review comes up, what is it going mean, to, we, we, we hide all that. We put that all down inside. So when then we come home and, 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 and the woman says, the wife says, what's up with you? You know, the garbage isn't out, the lawn's not mowed. Uh, you know, can't you do anything around here? Inside, what are you saying? Yeah, I know, I'm a failure. But I'm not going to let you get away with that. So I'm going to plop myself down on the couch, turn on the television, and leave you alone. Now, I'm being, you know, a bit facetious here, but... I'm going at the extreme. How do we overcome the fallenness that we were born into? I'll tell you what. The grace of God is what should make the finest marriages ever. Because God has given us the ability to do it that we never had before. And by the way, you say, well, what about people who aren't even saved? Some of them are great marriages. If they do, they're following God's patterns even if they don't admit it. God's patterns work. In the pattern described in Genesis 16, the wife seeks to dominate her husband in order to secure her needs. The husband rebuffs her attempts to dominate him by ruling over her, and he, he has the strength and power to do it. He has more uh, earning uh, capabilities, especially if you look at the ancient world and so forth. How interesting that the commands given to husbands and wives in the apostolic scriptures speak directly to these two issues. Husbands, what does it say? Love your wives. And here's the pattern. Just as Messiah loved the Kehilah and gave himself up for her. This is what it means. I remember when Paulette and I were in marital counseling 44 years ago. And the guy that was counseling us said, Tim, give me your definition of love. And that's difficult. I mean, he knew it was difficult. And he wanted me to fumble around. And I, you know, I gave him a scholastic kind of, well, you know, you, you, you know, you got agape and you got eros and, you know, and, and he's saying, no, 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 you know, no, uh, w w give me a definition of love. He said, let me give you a definition of love. Loving somebody is when you see their needs and you do something to meet them. Okay, 
It's a very simple definition of love. So that means you have to be a need scout. You need to go looking to see where the needs are. You need to ask. You need to be having your antenna up and so forth and so on. That's how we, what need did we have? We were separated from the Father. What did the Father do? He saw our need. He, he didn't, he didn't uh, dwell upon our inability. He saw our need. And what did he do? He met that need. How? By giving himself in an eternal way. One of the greatest mysteries of the world is why God wouldn't just wad the whole thing up and start over. It would have been a lot easier for him. Well, nothing's hard for him, so... But in terms of how we speak of it, he gave his precious son to die for us. He was sovereign. He could have just started a new lump of clay. That's not what he did. What do the apostolic scriptures tell the wives? Wives, uh-oh, be subject to your husbands. A very interesting title that I saw some years ago, read parts of it. Me, submit to him? was the name of the book. Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. But as the Kehila is subject to the Messiah, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now, obviously that has to be uh, unpacked. If a husband asks a wife to do something contrary to the scriptures, there needs to be some appeal go on and some... So let's, can we talk about this? Can we make it different, something different? But nonetheless, presuming that the husband is asking her to do what, what is right, she should submit. Returning to God's pattern for male and female relationship in marriage requires accepting God's ways even when they seem contrary to our natural reasoning. A husband who dies to self and puts his wife's needs above his own will discover that his wife no longer feels the need to control him. I can guarantee you guys, if you love your wife the way God intends you to, she will be happy to follow you. When she knows that she's absolutely secure, that you put her first above everyone else, that you're going to take everything necessary to keep her safe, to, to love her, to help her, to provide for her needs, I'll tell you what. She's ready to just follow you, be with you. Wherever you go, I'll go. And you're going to find out that all of a sudden she starts appreciating the stuff that you did that she didn't appreciate before. And she's going to start telling you. And the submissive wife discovers that her husband takes the initiative, responds to her needs, and provides the security she thought was available only if she controlled him. Gals, you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Nothing bugs a guy more than being controlled. In fact, the more you try to control us, the more we say, no, that ain't going to happen. Right? Am I right? Yes. The key is faith. Trusting that God's ways are right even when they seem contrary to our fleshly perspectives. Why? For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from the heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Now that's, I know that's in a specific context relating to the regathering of Israel, but still it it, it is a principle that can go across, across all scopes, right? If we follow God's word and we do it with a heart of humility and a desire to please him and a desire to do it his way and to honor Yeshua, we do it with a true heart. You can count on it. The word says he will bless you. He may not bless you the way you expect. You know, oh, that all of us could have Joseph's perspective you know at the end of the story you all meant it to me for evil God meant it to me for good sometimes he takes us through difficult times in order to teach us what he wants but he's still a blessing we learn that if we submit to him and as I said in a world and do you all agree that the world is kind of going crazy 
I mean, as I've been around and talked with people, I find a lot of people, if they're honest with you, that say they're, they're, they're really struggling with fear. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their houses. The economy's down. The government's going crazy. The Near East is in a turmoil. You've got Russia invading Crimea and Ukraine. And you say, what is going on? Are we on, the, are we on just the, the, the steps of Third World War here? What's going on? Excuse me for saying so, and so then you have the unlearned teachers telling you that the red moons are coming and the, you know, all of this other uh, uh, stuff that's supposed to be like the, the, the sky is falling. So you can live your life in fear. You can let fear rob you of the joy. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Trust in the Lord. Trust in Adonai with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, what's that? All your halacha, all of the things that you do in life. In all your ways, give acknowledgement to Him. Do it His way. And He will direct your paths. How blessed is the person who trusts in Him. So, you say, well, I've had a hard time submitting to my husband because, you know, I just he's, he's a rough guy to submit to. All right? Learn how to do it. Guys say, well, I know what's going to happen. If I do what you tell me, she's going to take advantage of me. If I start meeting her needs, the, the honey-do list is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Do you trust God or not? God's ways are right. They work. They change us. And, and I'll, just, I'll just end this session with this. There's nothing that's more powerful for the changing of the heart than love. Love changes the heart. When God sent his love upon us, it changed our hearts. So we don't keep his commandments in order to get kudos with him. We already have all the kudos we ever could have with him. Why? We're in his son. Why do we keep the commandments? If you love me, keep my commandments. Lord, I want, to, I want you to look at me and say, I'm well pleased. I want you to be pleased with my thoughts, with my words, with my actions. When I'm sharp with somebody, rebuke me, please, Ruach, so that I will hold my tongue. When I need to give a compliment, open my mouth so that I can say it in a way that is appropriate. Let me be one that lifts others up, not tears them down. And all of those things. And you know, you sleep well at night. You praise Him because He's worthy of praise. And you see it happening in your children and in your grandchildren. You see a Lador Vador, generation after generation, being raised up. There's nothing more powerful than what I've seen in the conferences that I've been at in our camp just last week. I watched the young people. I watched the children. I said, this is a generation that's growing up to know the Lord. That's powerful. That's really powerful. Yes? Out of Zion will go forth the Torah. And we have it. And we now can, as my brother Ariel said, it's our job to take the Torah to the nations. How do we sanctify the name? One of the ways that we do that is to make our marriages what God intends. All right? Thank you. Thank you.